Greetings to you this morning from St. Michael and All Angels Cathedral in Kelowna. As you gather from wherever you might be this morning via YouTube, as we continue to worship online in this time of care and caution due to the coronavirus. We gather this morning on the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, continuing to trace God's light and life amongst us in this season. As we gather, we gather being mindful that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Selic Okanagan people. We are especially mindful this week of the uh, revealing, once again, of unmarked graves from the time of the St. Joseph's Residential School in Williams Lake. And so we are mindful once again of this ongoing sorrow, and we continue to prayerfully and humbly ask God's healing for all who are closest to and affected by uh, this ongoing trauma. We continue to pray God's healing and indeed leading and guiding each of us and all of us in paths of peace and harmony into a shared future. Let us pray. We begin this day with opening scripture from Luke chapter 4. The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and release to the captives. And so the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to, to you, you all, all hearts are open, open all, all desires, desires known, known, and, and from, from you no secrets are hidden. hidden. Cleanse, Cleanse the, the thoughts, thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Living God, 
In Christ, you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Our psalm today is Psalm 71, verses 1 to 6. I invite you to join in to the psalm responsively by the half verse. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked. From the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God. My confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. Glory to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As, as it, it was, was in, in the, the beginning, beginning is, is now, and, and will, will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not exist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, 
and the greatest of these is love. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Now may the words of my lips, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
In many ways, today's scripture readings are all about knowing and being known. And so living in a space that is marked out and moving toward a future in God's redeeming love. From Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. From the psalm, in you, O Lord, I take refuge. From the words of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 13, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And from the Gospel of Luke, this one phrase that stands out so clearly is not this Joseph's son. Spoken in response to the gracious words Jesus has spoken among them, familiar to them in their locale, and yet from which that very familiarity, the prophetic voice with which Jesus speaks, engenders conflict and resistance when it is not understood. And so it seems to me that a common thread here in all these readings is the sense of both a deep connection to God, but also a tenuousness, a disconnect from God that is held in tension in the midst of a dynamic spiritual life of knowing and being known of the challenge of keeping the faith and living faithfully, especially when knowledge is only partial not complete, when we are always on the way in the midst of life and all that it brings our way. The prophet Jeremiah comes to us from the 7th century before the Common Era, leading up to the beginnings of the exile of the kingdom of Judah in the early 6th century, and then which reached its crescendo with the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. And so there, the full start of exile in Babylon for the Israelites. Jeremiah, as a prophet, is a descendant from the long line of priests that served under King David's reign. But Jeremiah often speaks with strong prophetic word again, words against this royal religion, quote-unquote, as it has evolved. It has led to a conflation of the service of God with a concern for national self-preservation, a dangerous mix, which biblical scholar Walter Ruggeman highlights as tipping the balance toward a greater trust in the policies of the empire than in that of the holy, faithful God, who leads the people of God always, no matter what, in practices of justice, risks of compassion, and sufferings for peace. Something that sometimes run against national interests and policies. In our Epiphany reading group this week, we encountered stories of characters who sought to place themselves in the way of the suffering and pain of others, not only as a matter of bringing comfort, but also as a matter of resisting injustice with compassionate ferocity. The story of Brian Stevenson told in Just Mercy, a book and also now a movie, stands out in this regard. Stevenson writes of being a black lawyer in the southern U.S. and founding the Equal Justice Initiative for the sake of addressing the highly disproportionate incarceration rate of black Americans in the prison system and of working tirelessly to prove the innocence of those unjustly incarcerated by unfair trials and a biased, often racist, system. Stevenson relays the story of a grandmother grieving the murder of her grandson at trial, being comforted by somebody who simply came over at the conclusion of the trial of her grandson's killers to sit with her, at first in silence, just to keep company with her, sitting with her in the face of the void of grief. Following on from that experience and the comfort it brought to her, this same grandmother eventually experienced a growing sense of call to return to the courthouse and to simply be there on the lookout for those who were 
emerging from trials, reeling and grieving, and in that state of, state of shock brought on by all the pain that is revisited in any given courtroom on any given day. She attended simply to be present to them, to be open to opportunities, to offer a shoulder to anyone who might need one on which to lean, knowing herself what it is like to be there. She comments simply, I decided that I was supposed to be here to catch some of the stones people cast at each other. In commenting on that story, the Anglican priest and ethicist Samuel Wells comments that such acts of stone catching are acts consistent with the way of Jesus, making his way to the cross, absorbing the stones we throw, and yet also, drawing on the images from the prophet Jeremiah, of carrying humankind from the midst of that plucking up that we read of in the words of Jeremiah to the planting of new seeds among us. In today's gospel, Jesus does just that, provoking rage by plucking at the sense of privilege carried by those who assume their own priority. But that plucking is only for the sake of a provocation that leads to planting seeds of change, looking toward the future, a new future, a redeemed future. So also, back to the prophet Jeremiah, who is part of God's plucking up, he is also part of God's planting. So I want to say a couple things about the call narrative we have read of Jeremiah, noting particularly the temporality of the passage. Before I formed you, I already knew you, God says. This before is coupled with a number of past tense verbs, formed, consecrated, appointed. Jeremiah's call is thus set up by God's prior intention, and so it is rooted in God's ongoing faithfulness. But Jeremiah's response is from the present, from his own situation, in the midst of his own experience, and it is filled with uncertainty, hesitation, ambivalence. I am only a boy, he says. In other words, I am not up to the task you have set for me. I am not ready for this appointment, this sending. It's too daunting. And yet, God's response to Jeremiah from the very beginning is toward a new future. You shall go to whom I send you. You shall speak whatever I command you. Jeremiah's life will be determined by God's call upon him. It will require trust. Of course, this narrative, this call narrative, is specific to Jeremiah. In terms of the literature of the biblical prophets, this is a typical call narrative, a stark telling of human feelings of inadequacy, but feelings that are then enveloped in the surrounding and indeed emboldening power of God to work through the prophet's weakness for the sake of God's purpose, of God's good, in God's strength. As a type, a call narrative also transcends its own time and place. It can be applied more widely. It can just as well step forward in time to ourselves, especially as we are gathered as the people of God in a shared faith, hope, and love, gathered by the Christ who becomes for us the stone catcher of all stone catchers. Jeremiah flags all that for us way back in the 7th century BCE, right on the edge of exile. Brueggemann remarks that the book of Jeremiah redescribes the historical process by which God's people, one, go into exile, but then surprisingly come out of exile. And that dynamic, that ebb and flow, is part of the ebb and flow of the people of God in their history. And within that history, God is doing unique work amongst them, and in turn, stepping forward, God is doing unique work amongst us, 
constantly calling, constantly sending, and very often doing so in the smallest, yet faith-filled of ways. Doing so especially, perhaps, where that involves some stone catching, absorbing, deflecting the barbs of others for the sake of the holy and faithful work that God is doing in the midst of whatever situation might be. Before, during, and in our midst even now, toward the future that God is building, the seeds that God is nurturing, having been planted. And so like the Israelites on the edge of being plucked, and then in a far-off future being replanted, so also the church through history will take different forms in different times, but always being called to reflect this call narrative, to remember the before the now and the not yet of what God has for us, even when that feels like something distant and difficult. In 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul speaks from the present, but with an eye toward the future as God's future. Now we see in a glass darkly, then we shall see face to face. In the midst of seeing in a glass or a mirror dimly, the apostle gives us these well-known words on faith, hope, and love, concluding that the greatest of these is love. What is this about? Well, this verse comes closest to being and offering a definition of God in all of Scripture, along with the statement that God is spirit. It's a beautiful combination because to say that God is spirit and that God is love is to point toward and encounter a transcendence that cannot be captured, contained, managed, manipulated. But that at the same time deeply informs a genuinely Christian spirituality. God is love. God is spirit. It is faith, hope, and love, Paul says, that abide, that remain, that stay, that hold. Faith is about trust, trust that God is, before, beyond, and with. Hope is about a persistent gaze toward the planting that God has done and will yet bring to fruition amongst us. And love is at the root of all of this because love begins and ends with the God who calls us into being and who envelops us in our end. In other words, in the midst of the constant flow of time, of the movement of past, present, future, in each moment, there is something that is simply a given that holds all these things together. In our opening collect, we prayed, Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature, in other words, our partiality, our incompleteness, our on-the-way-ness. Transform this by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives make known your glory. To pray that is to pray for a vocation. It is to pray for, to invite, to invoke God's work in and among our own work, with the deep sense that God has already gone before us, that God is already at work, And indeed, that God is already taking us somewhere. That our work, even when that work seems fragmented and frustrated, will be and indeed is nonetheless gathered up by God's grace and carried along in faith and hope and love. Amen. I invite you to join in in confessing the faith of the whole church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, creator creator of heaven heaven and earth. earth. I believe believe in Jesus Christ, Christ, his His only only Son, Son, our Lord. He was was conceived conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit Spirit and and born born of the Virgin Virgin Mary. Mary. He He suffered suffered under under Pontius Pontius Pilate. Pilate was was crucified, crucified, died, and and was buried. He descended descended to the dead. On the the third third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated seated at at the right hand hand of the Father. Father. He He will will come come again to judge the living living and the dead. dead. I I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Holy Catholic Church, Church, the communion communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our precious Heavenly Father, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. We welcome you this day with grateful thanks honor and praise, knowing your love never fails. Tomorrow we end the first month of a new year. It's hard to review the happenings in our world in just one month, and also reflecting those of us that made New Year resolutions and where we're at with that. Remembering the gifts the wise men brought to baby Jesus, God too has also given each one of us gifts, and know we too can incorporate those in our New Year's resolutions. We pray, Heavenly Father, to keep us in that wisdom and guidance which was revealed to the wise men as we continue throughout the year. To the bidding today, precious Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. We pray for the world-wide church, for the many challenges that the church is faced with today. We are conscious of the COVID pandemic and especially now the Omicron variant. All has caused havoc throughout the world and the impact it is having on our churches. We pray for all entrusted with Christian ministry in these difficult times and Lord for your help in keeping their focus and remembering God's word Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path, showing the way wherein we should go so that we may continue to reflect the glory of the Lord for others to see. We especially pray for the church of the province of the Indian Ocean and for the Right Reverend James Wong, Primate, Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own diocese, Lynn McNaughton, our bishop, Fernie Anglican United Shared Ministry, Andrea Brennan, incumbent, clergy on leave, Anita Desjardins, Sue Myers Hart, Kathy Pat, Partners in Mission, the Provincial Synod of the Ecclesiastical Province of Canada, the Lutheran, the Dean Council, and congregations of the Ottawa, Ottawa Valley, and Seaway areas of the Eastern Synod the Cathedrals of North America, the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist, St. John's Newfoundland, Pro-Cathedral Church of St. Clement, El Paso, Texas. Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own cathedral here in Kelowna, for our Dean, David, and his ministry here, his wife Leanne and family, and for all other clergy that minister here. 
We pray for all the ministries that are run from this cathedral, for those that contribute to the services and worship, the day-to-day administration, and the many volunteers. Remembering in our prayers our parish families, especially Donald and Joyce Webster, John and Cherie Webster, Rick and Lynn Wager. Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need, for the sick and the lonely, especially those in our special prayers today, Robin and Linda, Valerie, Shelley Lynn, Connie, Heather, June Sturrock Rodrum, John, Giles, Brian, Marv, Ruth and Colleen, Rowan, Steve, Norm, Dick, Amanda, May each one know a special touch today from you, Lord. Remembering also in our prayers today our indigenous people, especially now there is a new investigation at Williams Lake. We continue to pray for affected families and communities, for the help needed to bring some closure. We uphold in our prayers the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples for wisdom and guidance as they gather material and begin to prepare the recommendations from the Sacred Circle for the Church. Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world and those things of concern for our Queen, her health and well-being, and her family, for the many concerns and unrest of Britain's Parliament, the continuing talks and resolving issues between the Taliban and Afghanistan, for the seriousness and many concerns of the conflict and military invasions between Russia and Ukraine. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, in particular our own Prime Minister Trudeau and government here in Canada, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Our prayers are with those in the volcanic explosion in Tonga, where lives have been lost and extensive damage has changed lives forever. The Olympic Games in Beijing. We pray for all personnel and athletes, especially those representing Canada for their health and safety Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember in our prayers today the families and friends that have recently lost loved ones. Jane Fleming, Darcy Joyce, and Reverend Dr. Paul Gibbons and recently others that are suffering from loss of loved ones. May they know God's continued love, comfort and peace at this difficult time. We uphold each one of you in our prayers today that are taking part in this live streaming service. In a moment of silence, let us pray for our needs needs of concern and those of others, 
asking for God's help. Precious Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we enter into a new week and month, may the light of God's glory shine in the darkness of our lives. Make us attentive to his presence, prompt to serve him, and ever eager to follow in the steps of the one who is our true light, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Knowing his love never fails. Amen. And now as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. By way of announcements today, I draw your attention to those that have been printed in the announcement sheet from Friday, as well as uh, the email that went out from the church office. If you're not part of that uh, email announcement list, please do be in touch so we can add you. There is a post-church virtual coffee and conversation today at 11, a chance just to connect without masks, but obviously in a virtual environment and to chat and to catch up with those who are present. Also on Tuesday, a Zoom coffee hour will be happening Tuesday morning, 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. Welcoming this week, National Indigenous Archbishop Mark McDonald, a wonderful opportunity to chat with him about his role in the church and the work that is before him uh, that he has undertaken as, uh, as National Indigenous Archbishop across the country. There are also peer-to-peer fundraising opportunities in support of Metro Community and the Kelowna Gospel Mission upcoming. Uh, First, February 26th, the coldest night of the year, a walk in support of Metro uh, for which you would uh, gather sponsors, ask those who might be willing to sponsor you and then engage in the walk. And similarly, a long, long night of hope event running March 5 to 6 in, in which a nighttime event of engagement in some way, shape, or form um, uh, to identify with those who are homeless. Uh, You can undertake that. There are details on the longlongnightofhope.ca website, and proceeds will go to Kelowna Gospel Mission. In addition, there is a Lenten book study on the horizon, Uh, so an invitation to join in with the Central Okanagan Regional Parishes. We will uh, consider this our Lenten study collectively and join in uh, together across the region to read a book by Kate Bowler, No Cure for Being Human. And so details are there in the leaflet about making an order for a book fairly soon. If you need to order a book, if you're on your own, the book group starts March 6th. And beyond that, uh, anticipating the AGM that we are preparing for toward the end of February, an invitation to uh, be mindful of and, con- and consider uh, nominations. The nominations group from council includes our two wardens, Jack Ratti and John Miller, as well as council member Don Cornock, who have been assembling a list of nominees Uh, to be presented at the AGM. If you have questions or are interested or would like to suggest somebody for Cathedral Council, please be in touch via the Cathedral Office. I leave the remainder to you, encourage you in uh, your week ahead as we go from here. May God indeed continue to light our paths in this season of Epiphany.
And now as we go into the coming week, let us go being mindful of and declaring together the glory of God among us. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now may Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom. And the blessing of God, the Holy Trinity, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.